Hello and welcome to lecture 35 of analog integrated circuit design. In the previous lecture, we analyzed the telescopic cascode op amp in great detail. Also, we came up with a different topology by using a PMOS cascode device or a PMOS common gate amplifier with NMOS differential pair. We had this topology which was called the folded cascode op amp. In this lecture, we will analyze this in detail. Okay. This is the circuit we have. We have the NMOS differential pair followed by a PMOS cascode device and an NMOS current mirror to take the current from this side and combine it and give an output of GM1 VD, where VD is the differential input. Okay. Now, you see that the bias sources I0 by 2 used to subtract the current from M1 and the bias sources I2 of these uh, cascode devices are in parallel. So, they will be combined into a single source okay. and implemented with MOS transistors. I will draw the circuit including that modification. These are current source devices. These are cascode devices M one, M two, M five, M six, M zero. And we have the NMOS cascode current mirror. This voltage, the gate voltage, is some bias voltage generated from a PMOS current mirror. Okay, it could be something of that sort. I will not show it here, but that is how it is generated. Similarly, V G 0 is generated in the same way. Okay. So, this forms a current source I 0 and M 9 and M 10 implement a current source of I 0 by 2 plus I 2. And the output is taken from here. It can be loaded by a capacitor if we are implementing an op amp or it could be loaded by just a voltage source when we are testing it as a transconductor by monitoring the output current. Okay. And these are fixed bias voltages to bias the common gate amplifiers. Okay. So, this is our folded cascode op amp. Now, compared to the telescopic cascode op amp, we have these two extra devices M 9 and M 10. Okay. In the telescopic cascode op amp, everything was stacked up on top of each other and we did not need these extra uh, sources for biasing, but now we do. We have to see what the effect of those things are. Now, because we have already analyzed the cascode op amp in detail, I will not go into every detail of uh, this particular op amp. I will only analyze those aspects which are different from this compared to the telescopic cascode. Okay. So, first of all let me uh, draw the quiescent currents, write down the quiescent currents here. In the two arms it will be 
I naught by 2 and I naught by 2 okay. and in M5, M6 and these uh, other transistors it will be I2 and I2 okay. Now, if I apply an incremental voltage V d by 2 and minus V d by 2 to the differential pair, the current in M 1 increases by G M 1 V d by 2, this voltage is almost at 0 even with asymmetrical loads as we analyzed earlier and this is at minus G M 1 V d by 2. Okay. Now, if you work it out, you will see that in this transistor in M 6 we will have I 2 plus G M 1 V D by 2 that comes from Kirchhoff's law at this node and similarly in M 5 we will have I 2 minus G M 1 V D by 2 okay. and it also gets mirrored in M 4 and M 8. So, finally, here we will have I 2 minus G M 1 V D by 2 and I out as we knew was simply G M 1 times V D okay, exactly the same as before. So, the transconductance of the folded cascode op amp is also G M 1, it is simply the transconductance of the input differential pair. This is not very surprising because all we have done is to use current buffers with unity gain after the differential pair. Okay. Now, the important thing is the output conductance because the high output conductance is the reason we go to cascode topologies. Let me remove all of this. Now, by symmetry just like in the differential pair and, then and in the telescopic cascode op amp, the voltage here and there were the same in the quiescent condition. Let me remove the load altogether. If uh, the devices are exactly matched, the voltage on the drain of M 7 and at the drain of M 8 will be exactly the same. You can assume them to be different and come up with the contradiction as usual and that is the voltage with which we will terminate the transconductor. Okay. Well, let us say to this I add a test voltage V test and I have to find out how much current will flow there. Okay. Now, it turns out that the situation is exactly the same as before. In fact, the transistors are numbered so that they are functionally identical to the similar number transistors. Okay. M1 and M2 are the differential pair, M3 and M4 are the main current mirror, M5 and M6 are the cascodes for the differential pair, M7 and M8 are the cascodes for the current mirror. We also have these extra transistors M9 and M10. Okay. Now, before what we had was that the contribution of the current source to the output conductance was simply the output conductance of the cascode current source. Okay. So, we had G out to be G D S 3, G D S 7 by G M 7. Okay. That is the contribution due to this and the contribution due to the differential pair was G D S 5, G D S 1 divided by G M 5. Okay. That is because the total conductance in the source of uh, M 5 was contributed by the differential pair. Okay. Now, in addition to that we see that we have another transistor M 9 over here. Okay. So, it turns out that the output conductance due to the differential pair will also include the output conductance of these current source transistors M 9 and M 10. So, I will not analyze this, please go ahead and do that and you will find that this G D S 9 simply adds to G D S 1. Okay. 
we have GDS1 looking this way. The actual situation is complicated because of the uh, asymmetric injection and this we have worked out earlier, but the final result is that GDS1 will appear in parallel with GDS9. Okay. So, the total uh, output conductance will be that much. The only difference is that because of these extra current source transistors, we also have an additional output conductance okay, which will reduce the DC gain. So, this is in fact a disadvantage. We have the folded cascode transconductor and when it is loaded by a capacitor C, it becomes a folded cascode op amp of uh, unity gain frequency G m 1 by C. So, the transconductance of this is G m 1, the output conductance is that one. Okay. Now, what about the frequency response? We see that the number of nodes in the circuit is exactly the same as before okay. and qualitatively they are also the same, except that there are these two transistors M 9 and M 10. So, we will have parasitic capacitance at this node. So, we will have this which I have been calling C D 3. This causes a pole in the current mirror. Okay. So, if you inject a current into this, the output will be that current times 1 over 1 plus s by this pole okay. and the pole value we know is G M 3 by C D 3. And because it acts only on half of the current, the current from M 1, there will also be a 0 at twice that frequency. Okay. This is exactly the same as what was the case with the simple differential pair op amp and also the telescopic cascode op amp. Okay. In addition to that, we have C D 1, C D 2 and here maybe I should call this C S 7 and C S 8. Okay. Now, each of these uh, capacitors C D 1, C D 2, C S 7, C S 8 are at the input nodes of common gate amplifiers and the input resistance of the common gate amplifier is simply 1 over G m of the cache coding device. So, each of these will create poles of uh, value G m 7 by C s 7, G m 8 by C s 8, G m 5 by C d 1, G m 6 by C d 2. Okay. Now, there is an additional complication because this particular uh, pole C s 7 and uh, G m 7 is inside this local feedback loop and also all these uh, poles from the lower side in the current mirror will act only on one half of the current. Okay. They will act on only the current from M 1, not from M 2. So, they will also create additional zeros. Okay. They will have to be uh, taken into account. It is just too cumbersome to calculate. For now, we will just be satisfied with saying that there will be poles at these frequencies and also some additional zeros at similar frequencies. Okay. Now, this uh, pole at the source of M 5 and M 6 due to C D 1 and C D 2, they act on both the current from M 1 and the current from M 2. So, there will be a pole of value G m 5 divided by C d 1 in the transfer function. Okay. So, qualitatively the results are exactly the same as for the telescopic cascode op amp. One difference is that because of these additional transistors, we also get additional parasitic capacitances. Before C d 1 consisted of C d b of m 1, C s b of m 5, C G S of M 5. Now, in addition to these, we also have C D B of M 9. Okay. 
So, while qualitatively it is the same, the parasitic capacitance value will be higher and so the pole frequency will be at a lower value. Also note that these transistors M9 and M10 carry large currents compared to M1, M2 or these other transistors. So, they tend to be larger to uh, produce larger currents, we have to have larger transistors. So, their parasitic capacitance also tends to be larger and the poles will be further pushed to lower frequencies. Okay. So, the folded cascode has similar parasitic poles as the telescopic cascode, but they will tend to be at lower frequencies. So, overall the telescopic cascode will be slower in that if you have parasitic poles at lower frequencies, you have to push the unity gain frequency to a sufficiently low value where you have enough phase margin. Okay. These are the non dominant poles and zeros. And then many more of the type of uh, GM5 by CD1 and so on. Okay. But we will have larger parasitic capacitances due to M9 and M10. Okay. First of all, there will be additional and the parasitic capacitance due to M9 and M10 tend to be larger than those of other transistors. Okay. Now, the next thing is noise and offset usually they have similar behavior. So, that is why we treat them together. As before, we evaluate the output noise of the transconductor operating into a voltage source load. Okay. Now, just as before, the noise from the cascode transistors do not reach the output and noise from the differential pair as well as the current mirror M3 and M4 reach the output in their entirety. Okay. They will uh, contribute completely to the output noise. I am not going to work this out again, but uh, please uh, work it out for these individual transistors M1, M2, M3, M4, M5, M6 and M7, M8. Okay. The arguments are very similar to what we had earlier. Now, in addition to those transistors, we also have transistors M9 and M10. So, we will see what happens to the noise from those devices. Okay. Let us say I have this noise IN9 what happens to it? The incremental current I n 9 is applied at the input of this common gate amplifier M 5. So, I n 9 flows that way, it will get mirrored in this current mirror. So, it will flow that way and it will flow to the output. Okay. Similarly, the noise current of M10, IN10, as you can see, this is applied to the input of the common gate amplifier M6. So, it will go entirely into the current buffer because the common gate amplifier or the current buffer presents a very low input impedance, right? So, you apply current at the input, the same current appears at the output of the current buffer. So, IN10 appears there. Now, as usual, please do the analysis including GDS and so on. I have assumed that there is no GDS at all. So, all of this simply appears uh, through M6 and at the output. Okay. Now, the contribution of M1 for instance can be split into two parts. Uh, the part that is connected to the tail node will not contribute anything. The part that is connected here will go through the current mirror and contribute to the output. 
okay. So, I will not work out all those things again, but I will just say that the output current will be I n 1 minus I n 2 plus I n 3 minus I n 4. This part is exactly the same as before. In addition to this, we will also have plus I n 9 minus I n 10. Okay. These are due to the current source which are used to bias the PMOS cascode as well as the current sources used to subtract the bias from the input differential pair. Okay. So, what is the output noise uh, spectral density? is the sum of the spectral densities of all these and the spectral densities of these two are identical, these two are identical and those two are identical. We will end up getting 16 by 3 kT gm 1 due to the first pair, gm 3 due to the second pair and gm 9 due to the third pair. So, first of all there is extra noise, the noise from devices m 9 and m 10. Also, M9 and M10 carry a large current, so they also tend to have a larger GM. Okay, they carry a larger current than either the differential pair transistors or the other cascode current mirror transistors. Okay, so they'll also have larger noise. They tend to have a larger GM. It is possible to design them with a smaller GM, but that needs a high overdrive voltage and compromise the swing limit. Okay. So that is the story with the uh, noise. Let us see what happens to offset. Again, there will be offset between the pairs M1 and M2, M3, M4, M5, M6 and M7, M8. And just as before, the contributions from the cascode devices M5, M6, M7, M8 will be 0 and the input pair will contribute completely to the output and this pair will also contribute exactly the same as before. So, I will not work it out, but just as practice, please do so. The output current due to mismatch. is delta Vt 1 2 times G m 1. Delta Vt 1 2 is simply being applied at the input of the transconductor plus delta Vt 3 4 times G m 3. Okay. It is applied here and comes to the output with the transconductance of G m 4 which is the same as G m 3. Now, as usual we have to take care of these extra devices, we have to see what happens due to those things. Okay. Now, let us say I have a mismatch between uh, these two transistors. First of all, if there is no mismatch at all, this will be biased from a current mirror such that there is a current I naught by 2 plus I 2 in M 9 and I naught by 2 plus I 2 in M 10. Okay. And I will represent the mismatch as though it is acting only on M 9, it is the mismatch between the two transistors that we are concerned about. So, now you see that the gate voltage of M 10 is at V G 9 and the actual gate voltage of M 9 is at V G 9 minus delta V T 9 10. Okay. So, this of course, is a representation of the changed V T, the difference in V T between M 9 and M 10. Okay. So, what will this do? Compared to the ideal current of I naught by 2 plus I 2, there will be an incremental current which is 
given by g m 9 delta v t 9 10. Okay. So, that will get added on to this flowing in the downwards direction. So, what happens to this incremental current? The other part remains the same as before. Okay. So, we will examine only the incremental part of the current and that goes into the uh, cascode transistor or common gate amplifier M 5 through the current mirror and comes to the output. Okay. In other words, it goes here and then gets mirrored and is drawn from the output. So, this current equals G m 9 times delta V t 910. So, in addition to these contributions, we will also have minus delta V t 910 times G m 10. Okay. And if we divide the entire result by G m 1 and take the variance to get the input referred uh, offset. The variance of input referred offset is nothing but this mismatch induced output current divided by G m 1 and the sigma square of that one. Okay. So, what we will have is sigma v o square, the variance of input referred offset is sigma v t 1 2 square, which appears directly as usual, sigma v t 3 4 square multiplied by g m 3 by g m 1 square and also sigma v t 9 10 square times g m 10 by g m 1 square. Okay. So, just as with noise, there is this extra term due to the current source transistors m 9 and m 10. And as before, you observe that g m 9 tends to be large value because of the larger currents in those transistors. So, the contribution of mismatch from the these current sources can be significant. Okay. So, what we have got by changing the NMOS cascode devices to PMOS is two extra devices and they contribute to DC gain, they reduce the DC gain because they contribute to the output conductance. They also increase the value of input referred noise and the input referred offset voltage. Okay. Now, what other effect do they have? So, for that we will calculate the other large signal parameters which are the slew rate and the swing. Okay. So, first let us calculate the slew rate. I have the op amp and I will assume a unity feedback configuration, though that is not necessary. This is the minus input terminal, I will connect it to the output. Basically, I am making this amplifier okay. and I apply an input step V i. Okay. What happens then? As usual, this voltage does not change immediately. So, we have an incremental current G m 1 V i by 2 going in this direction okay. and the current in M 5 would be I 2 minus G m 1 V i by 2 and current in M 6 would be I 2 plus G m 1 V i divided by 2. Now, as we go on increasing the value of V i, this current will go on increasing, but clearly it cannot increase beyond the tail current I naught. Okay. So, at some point we will have I naught here and nothing here, okay. that will be just 0. So, under those conditions, the current here will be I 2 minus I naught by 2. Okay. The 
is this fine? And the current in this arm would be I 2 plus I naught by 2. So, what will be the rate of change of the output? I 2 minus I naught by 2 will flow through M 8 and M 4. Okay. So, what goes to the output will be equal to I naught. So, it appears to be exactly the same as before. Okay. Now, this makes one particular assumption, this calculation. What we have assumed is that this value of I 2 is greater than I naught by 2. Okay. So, that is what we have assumed here. Now, so far we have not made any assumptions about the value of I 2. Now, we see that we will get a current of I 2 minus I naught by 2 flowing through M 5 only if I 2 is greater than I naught by 2. If I 2 happens to be less than I naught by 2, nothing will flow here. The transistor M 9 will go off into the triode region okay, and nothing will flow through these. So, if I 2 is greater than I naught by 2, the slew rate will be I naught divided by C. Now, what happens if I 2 is less than I naught by 2? As you increase the magnitude of V i, at some point this G m 1 V i by 2, this current in M 1 will go on increasing. Okay. Now, even before it reaches a value of I naught, okay, it reaches a value of I naught by 2 plus I 2. Okay. Remember, now I 2 is less than I naught by 2, so this entire uh, number is less than I naught. Okay. This current flowing here is less than I naught. Now, at that point what happens? If you have I naught by 2 plus I 2 and I naught by 2 plus I 2 coming here, so the current in M 5 is 0. Okay. So, the current in M 5 is 0 and so the current through this is also 0. Now, let us calculate the current through this part that will be I naught by 2 minus I 2. Okay. So, the net current flowing through M 6 is the difference of I naught by 2 plus I 2 and I naught by 2 minus I 2. So, what is that? That number is simply 2 times I 2 okay. and no current is flowing through M 8 M 4 because this side is off. There is no current flowing here either. So, 2 times I 2 will flow into the output capacitor and that will be the maximum rate of change of the output voltage. Okay. So, what we have is if I 2 is greater than I naught by 2, the slew rate is I naught by C and if that is not the case, the slew rate will be 2 I naught by C okay. and this can be simply written as the minimum value of I naught sorry this is 2 I 2 by C. So, minimum value of I naught and 2 I 2 divided by C. Okay. Now, this gives you a guideline of how to choose I 2. We would not like the slew rate to be limited to a small value because one current is smaller than the other. Okay. So, the normal choice is to make I 2 to be exactly equal to I naught by 2, so that these two limits will coincide. Okay. And this is a common choice. Okay. Now, earlier I said that M9 and M10 contribute to noise and mismatch and output conductance and so on. Now, because they carry more current than the other transistors, uh, they will also have uh, more GM, so more noise, etcetera, etcetera. We could try to reduce that by making this I2 very small, that is as small as possible. But if you do that, the slew rate will be severely compromised. Okay. A reasonable value for I 2 is to make it equal to I naught by 2. Okay. So, what happens in that condition is that the quiescent current in M 1, M 2 
m5 m6 m7 m8 m3 m4 will all be equal to i0 by 2 and the quotient current here in m9 and m10 will be equal to i0 okay so that is the skew rate now so far it looks as though this uh, new topology where we used a pmos uh, common gate amplifier with an nmos differential pair has only disadvantages it has uh, more noise more offset more output conductance and so on it also has more power dissipation because as you can see the total current is equal to i0 plus 2 i2 okay we have extra branches here so the total current which was originally i0 is now i0 plus 2 i2 if we make i2 equal to i0 by 2 we'll have a total current of 2 i0 okay exactly double of what we had for the simple differential pair as well as the telescopic cascode op amp okay so this topology it looks like it has only disadvantages but there is one aspect in which this is more advantageous compared to the uh, other one so that's what we'll see now and that is the swing limit okay as before we have a swing limit on the output and a swing limit on v bias okay what is the limit on v bias as v bias reduces the transistor m0 gets squeezed and it will go into the triode region okay so v bias has to be at least equal to the familiar value of uh, vd sat 0 plus vt1 plus vd sat 1 vd sat 1 at a current of i0 by 2 and vd sat 0 at a current of i0 okay and what i what is the upper limit what happens to uh, the transistors as v bias keeps on increasing now we see here that these two nodes are biased at a fixed voltage okay which is given by vg5 plus vsg5 right in the quiescent condition current of uh, i2 flows through these transistors and the voltage is here is vg5 plus vsg5 at a current of i2 okay so that is the drain voltage of m1 and m2 now this v bias can go above that but not by more than 1 vt so the upper limit on v bias would be vg5 plus vsg5 plus vt1 okay whatever that value is now what would be the normal voltage chosen for these points now these transistors m9 and m10 must be in saturation okay so whatever this voltage is that voltage plus uh, vt1 is the limit on the input so we would like to maximize this voltage now if you take this voltage very close to the supply voltage vdd what happens is that m9 and m10 will enter the triode region we would not want that so these two nodes will be biased at something like vdd minus vd sat 9 at whatever current it is carrying which is i0 by 2 plus i2 okay it may be a little lower than this but you would not make it much lower okay because the these are uh, fixed current sources and these voltages are also fixed so you keep this voltage to be the minimum required to keep the transistors in saturation region okay so in that case the upper limit on v bias will be whatever this voltage is plus vt1 so it is vdd minus vd sat 9 
plus V T 1. Okay. Now, typically the gate overdrive voltages or the saturation voltage V D sat will be of the order of 150, 200 or maybe 300 milli volts and the threshold voltage is at least half a volt even in uh, sub micron technologies. Okay. So, you see that this limit is actually more than V D D. So, in this particular case the input common mode range can go all the way up to V D D. Okay. Now, it depends on the choice of uh, the voltage at the drain of M 9 and M 10, but it can be easily arranged. So, that the input common mode range includes the supply voltage V D D. Okay. And what about the output range? If V out goes on reducing, it will go below V G 7 and if it goes one threshold below V G 7, M 8 will enter triode region. Okay. So, the lower limit is V G 7 minus V T 7, which is the same as V T 8 and the upper limit is as it goes on increasing transistor M 6 will enter triode region, if it goes above V G 5 by one threshold voltage. So, the upper limit is V G 5 plus V T 5. Okay. Now, this limits depend on the choice of V G 7 and V G 5, we would like to uh, minimize V G 7 and maximize V G 5. Okay. So, that will give us the maximum swing limit. Now, what is the maximum value of V G 5? As V G 5 goes on increasing, the source of M 5 and M 6 also follow V G 5. So, M 9 and M 10 will enter triode region if V G 5 is too high. Okay. So, the highest possible value of V G 5 is V D sat 9, so that this transistor is just in saturation plus V S G 5, which is V T 5 plus V D sat 5. Okay. If we do adjust it to this value, at the highest value of V out, the highest possible value of V out will be nothing but this plus V T 5. Now, as V G 5 goes on increasing, the source of M 5 and M 6 will go on increasing and M 9 and M 10 will enter the triode region. So, the highest value is where M 9 and M 10 are biased at the edge of triode region and you have one V S G across M 5 and M 6. Okay. So, across this we have a V D sat and across this we have V S G. So, the maximum value of V G 5 is equal to V D D minus V D sat 9 minus V S G 5, which is basically V D sat 5 minus V T 5. Okay. Now, if we set V G 5 to its highest possible value, the upper swing limit here will be, this will be nothing but V D D minus V D sat 9 minus V D sat 5. Okay. This is not surprising, we have just one V D sat across M 9 and M 10 and one V D sat across M 6. Okay. So, this can go within two V D sats of V D D. Similarly, what is the lowest value of V G 7? When V G 7 reduces, the source of M 7 and M 8 fall down and if they become too small, M 3 and M 4 will enter triode region. Okay. So, the smallest value of V G 7 would be to accommodate a V D sat across this and V G S of M 8. Okay. So, that will be V D sat 3 plus V S G 7, which is V D sat 7 plus V T 7. Now, if I substitute that over here, what do I get? I will have V D sat 3 plus V D sat 7. Okay. So, just like on the upper side, all I have to do is to leave one V D sat for M 4 and one V D sat for M 8. Okay. So, it can also come within 
two saturation voltages of the lower rail or ground. Okay. So the swing limits of the folded cascode op amp. are given by this is the range for the input common mode voltage and this can be a maximum of V D D minus V D sat 9 plus V T 1. The lower limit is the same as it has always been V D sat 0 plus V D sat 1 plus V T 1 okay. and the output voltage has a limit of V G 5 plus V T 5 and here V G 7 minus V T 7 and with the optimum values of V G 5 and V G 7, we will have V D sat 3 plus V D sat 7 on the lower side and V D D minus V D sat 9 minus V D sat 5 on the upper side. Okay. So, the output can go within 2 V D sats of the supplies and this is the advantage of the telescopic cascode op amp. The swing limits are a lot higher than in the differential pair and also in the telescopic cascode op amp. Okay. So, the folded cascode op amp has a lot higher swing limit and that is why it is used in many cases where the signal swing is important. And also another thing to note is that in the telescopic cascode op amp, unlike in the other cases, the input is applied to some devices and the output node is from a different device. Okay. So, the constraints on the input and output are more independent in this case than in the simple differential pair or the telescopic cascode. Okay. What we have done so far is to analyze uh, single stage op amps, what are known as single stage op amps. These are called single stage op amps because there is a single transconductor G M 1. Okay. As you recall the expression for uh, transconductance for all these three uh, op amps, the differential pair, telescopic and folded cascodes is G M 1. What is different is the output resistance and that gives you different values of DC gain. Now, uh, the details of uh, uh, noise and offset are by and large similar in the three op amps except that in the folded cascode you have extra devices. So, you have extra noise and offset. Okay. Now, the telescopic and folded uh, cascode op amps give you higher DC gain that is why they are uh, popular. And uh, finally, if you really want a high swing, you go for the folded cascode because it gives you the uh, highest swing that is possible. Now, the slew rate is similar for all three op amps and because the telescopic and folded cascodes have uh, more nodes compared to the differential pair, they also have more parasitic poles and zeros and this limits their speed to uh, lower value compared to the differential pair. That is, if you have more parasitic poles, you need to make sure that your unity gain frequency is uh, low enough, your integrator is slow enough. So, that in spite of all those parasitic delays, you are stable that is your phase margin is sufficient. Okay. So, that is a quick summary of uh, uh, single stage op amps. Now, we know that single stage op amps are not very useful when we have resistive loads because they have some transconductance G M 1 and the telescopic and folded cascodes have a higher output resistance. But let us say we load all these three op amps with a given load resistance R L which happens to be much smaller than the output resistance of the op amps. Then all three will give the same DC gain. Okay. So, it is only with a, a capacitive load that the telescopic cascode and the folded cascode op amps give you a higher gain than the differential pair. If you put a resistive load and a typical resistive load has a lower value than the output resistance of transistors, all three will give equal gain and that is not useful. In order to have a high DC gain with a resistive load, as we have discussed earlier when we discussed the op amps at the control source level, we have to go to two stages. right? So, instead of uh, converting the output of the transconductor into a voltage by passing it through a capacitor directly, we should uh, use a current controlled voltage source stage 
a second stage across which we connect the integrating capacitor C and form the two stage op amp. Okay? And we will discuss the details of that in the next lecture. Thank you.